As a parent, it's natural to want to give your child all the things you didn't have when you were growing up and to give them the best start in life that you can. That's why it seems so inconceivable that a woman who, to the outside, looked like the perfect wife and mother would decide to disappear and start a new life. Or did she? Let's uncover the unsolved disappearance of Joan Reish. Hello and welcome to the 33rd episode of Uncover True Crime Podcast. My name is Stephanie and each week we uncover a different unsolved true crime case ranging from unsolved murders, missing persons, Jane and John Doe's and suspicious deaths. You can listen to the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher and other podcast streaming apps as well as on YouTube by searching Uncover True Crime. You can follow the podcast on Twitter at Uncover underscore pod, on Instagram at Uncover True Crime pod or join the Uncover True Crime discussion group on Facebook. But without any further ado, Let's uncover the unsolved disappearance of Joan Reish. Joan Carolyn Baird was born on the 12th of May 1930 and was the only child to Harold and Josephine Baird. The three of them lived in a house on Dorchester Road in Brooklyn, New York until the 23rd of February 1939 when both Harold and Josephine died from suffocation in a fire in the home. Joan was visiting her grandmother at the time of the blaze so while she wasn't physically harmed there is no doubt that this traumatic event would have majorly impacted her throughout her life. She was fostered and eventually adopted by her mother's sister Alice Natrice and her husband Frank and Joan chose to take on their last name. An article by the Boston Globe stated that Joan had disclosed to her closest friends that she'd been sexually abused by a family member as a young child, another aspect of her life that would have haunted her well into her adult years. Despite everything she had gone through, Joan did well in school and won a scholarship to attend Wilson College in 1948, where she graduated with a degree in English in 1952. She chose a career in publishing and worked at a few different publishing firms in New York City. She started off off as a secretary, was promoted to a supervisor and then worked her way up to being an editorial assistant. It was during this time that she met the love of her life, Martin Reich, and they got married in 1956. The two of them chose to move out of the city and they bought a house on Old Bedford Road in Ridgefield, Massachusetts, which is where they would have their two children, Lillian and David. Joan quit her job to become a stay-at-home mother and while I do not know if she was planning on returning to work when her children were older, Everyone who knew Joan said that she loved being a mother and was dedicated to her kids and husband. Her life seemed idyllic, until one day she got up, cared for her children, completed some errands, and then vanished. The 24th of October 1961 started like any other day. Martin Reich left for New York on a business trip early that morning and Joan's day started like any other. She dropped her son David off with her next door neighbour Barbara while she went into town. She attended a dentist appointment with her daughter, cashed a cheque at the bank and then went shopping. She returned home around 11am and after picking David up she put him down for a nap. The milkman, dry cleaner and mailman all came and went from the Reese residence that day and none of them thought anything was amiss. At 1.55pm she took Lillian and Barbara's son who had both been playing in her front garden to the park. She told them to play there for a while and that she would come and get them soon, although she never returned. At 2.15, Barbara spotted a blue or grey 1954 or 1955 sedan in the Reese driveway. This stuck out to her as it wasn't a car she recognised. At this same time, she saw Joan coming out of her house, carrying something red in her hands that she was keeping close to her abdomen and she seemed rather dazed. Barbara assumed that she was chasing after one of the kids and went back back inside without ever speaking to Joan. There was no way that Barbara could have known that she would be the last confirmed person to ever see Joan alive. I don't know whether Lillian and Barbara's son went to Barbara's house on their own or if Barbara found them at the park, but either way they ended up back at her house. At 3.40pm, Barbara sent Lillian back to her own house as she had to go out to complete chores of her own. When she returned at 4.15, Lillian was still sitting outside. Barbara asked her what was going on and that's when Lillian said, quote, Mummy's gone and there's red paint on the floor, unquote. Confused, Barbara investigated and was horrified to find that the substance on the kitchen floor was not paint, it was blood. 
The police arrived a short time later and they expected to find Joan's body in the house as they assumed it was going to be an open and shut suicide case. They searched the house and although they found David crying in his cot, Joan was nowhere to be found. The blood trail started at David's bedroom, continued into the kitchen and then led police outside to her car where they found a coat hanger on the roof of the vehicle. In her kitchen they saw an overturned chair lying on the ground and empty beer bottles. There was a bloody thumbprint on the phone mount, the phone itself had been ripped from the wall and put in the waste paper bin, and the phone book was open at the emergency services page, bearing in mind that this was before 911 was created, so the number you would have to call in an emergency would depend on what service you required. Another bizarre thing about the scene in Joan's kitchen was that there was no footprints in the blood on the floor, so it seems as though whoever else was at the scene was very careful not to leave any trace behind. And yes, Police are positive that there was indeed someone else there, as the bloody thumbprint on the phone mound was not Jones. Initially, I was confused as to how they knew the print wasn't Jones, as I don't believe they would have any reason to have her prints on file. Turns out that they were obtained while she was a student at New Rochelle High School back when she lived in New York, and while I'm still not exactly sure on why they were taken, I assume it was for some sort of school project. Someone had clearly tried to clean up the blood with some paper towels and with David's overalls, but from looking at the crime scene photos, they didn't do a very good job. While DNA was not available back in 1960, police were able to determine that the blood was type O, which is the same as Jones, so it's been assumed that the blood was in fact hers. It was also determined that the amount of blood over the kitchen floor was around a pint, so it was clear that someone had been injured, but this amount of blood loss wouldn't be fatal on its own. Just to put one pint of blood into perspective, you would lose around the same amount during a blood donation or vaginal childbirth. You may feel a little bit lightheaded depending on how the blood loss occurred, but you probably wouldn't be stumbling around looking dazed or confused. But that's a description several motorists gave of a woman matching Joan's description just 30 minutes after she was last seen by Barbara. This woman was seen at various points between Route 2A, which was only 200 yards from Joan's home and Route 128. She was seen at 2.45, 3.15, 3.30 and finally at 4.35 p.m. Despite the fact that the woman looked dishevelled, was holding something close to her abdomen and had blood running down her leg, no one stopped to help her. The woman has never been confirmed as being Joan, but it is widely believed that it was her. When police spoke to people who had seen Joan that day, the milkman claimed to have seen the same sedan that Barbara saw. He said that the sedan was parked at a wooded area near Joan's house, and that he saw a man pulling branches off of a tree, putting them in the car and then driving off. Another neighbour said that she had seen this same sedan parked outside Joan's house around five days before she went missing, so around the 19th of October. Police have never been able to determine who the print belongs to, and the sedan has never been located. That is everything publicly known about the investigation, so let's get on to the theories. As with all of the theories I discuss on this podcast, they are all pure speculation. The first theory is that Joan left of her own accord to start a new life. Martin Reich is convinced that Joan was happy and loved her kids too much to abandon them, but online sleuthers are not convinced. In the summer before she disappeared, Joan had checked out 25 mystery and crime thriller books from the local library, and a few of them were about people who faked their own deaths and started a new life. This is the only real quote-unquote evidence that Joan ran away, and to be honest, I don't think it proves anything. Loads of people enjoy thriller, mystery, and crime fiction novels, me being one of them. That doesn't mean that I or any other avid reader of the genre is planning on faking their own death. This theory also doesn't explain the bloody thumbprint, the blood found at the scene, or the disorientated woman thought to be Joan seen walking down the side of the freeway. The second theory is that Joan was involved in an accident, hit her head and staggered away from her home in a confused daze. She then either died of her injuries, stumbled into the construction site off of Route 128 and was accidentally buried there, or suffers from amnesia and is still out there somewhere with no idea of who she really is. The biggest issue with this theory, in my opinion, is 
what caused the initial injury. There was nothing in her home that looks as though it would have caused such an injury and it doesn't explain the bloody thumbprint. The third theory is that she was a victim of foul play. Did someone come into her house, attack her, kidnap her and then kill her somewhere else? It's possible, but what's the motive? There are rumours online that she was having an affair and was killed by her lover, but that's all this is, a rumour. There was absolutely no evidence that she was having an affair. As with every investigation, police have to look at those closest to the victim, including the spouse. But as Martin was confirmed to have left the state earlier that day, he was cleared as a suspect. Many have speculated that the fact that Martin was out of the state the day that his wife went missing was very convenient and that it's possible he hired someone to kill his wife. I think that in order to accuse someone of murder for hire, you have to have way more evidence than a pure coincidence. Also, this doesn't seem like a hit to me at all. The scene was very messy, the sedan was in plain view and was seen by several of her neighbours, and if the woman seen walking down Route 128 and Route 1A was Joan, she was able to leave the house alive. Doesn't seem like a professional killing to me at all. The fourth, and in my opinion, most plausible theory is that Joan died during a botched abortion. I would like to say now that if anybody is triggered by the topic of abortion, there will be a timestamp in the description of this episode so you can skip right past this theory. Joan disappeared over 10 years before the landmark Roe v Wade Supreme Court decision, which legalised abortions in America. Before this point, women who wanted to end a pregnancy were forced to hire the services of back alley abortionists, which was very dangerous and had a high fatality rate. Is it possible that Joan discovered she was pregnant, thought she couldn't cope with having three kids under the age of five, and chose to terminate her pregnancy without Martin's knowledge? Martin has never given in media interviews about the case. But I believe I either heard or read somewhere, although I can't remember where, that he said that he and Joan would have been very happy if they'd found out she was pregnant. While I'm sure Martin would have been happy, he wasn't the stay-at-home parent, and it's very possible that Joan was struggling and thought that she either couldn't physically or emotionally cope with a third child, or that another child would put too much of a financial strain on the family. Again, I don't know any of this for certain, and I am very aware that there are a lot of reasons why a woman might seek an abortion. I believe that the sedan seen outside the home belonged to the person that Joan had hired to perform the abortion, and that they visited her a few days beforehand to discuss it with her. On the 24th of October, Joan does her usual chores and gets on with the day as usual, not wanting anyone to suspect that anything is wrong. When she knows the doctor is on their way, she sends Lillian and Barbara's son over to the park so they wouldn't walk in on what's about to happen. She drinks some alcohol either to hurry the process along, to calm her nerves, or as an anaesthesia of sorts. The person arrives, performs the procedure, but there is a complication and Joan loses more blood than she is supposed to. She panics and goes to call the emergency services, but the unknown person rips the phone out of the wall as they are scared of getting caught for performing the abortion. Joan stumbles outside to her car, hoping to get help, but the unknown person persuades her to get into their car with them and leaves her on the side of the road after driving her far enough away from her house that her neighbours won't see what's going on. Many people have speculated about the significance of the coat hanger found on top of Joan's car, and while it's possible the dry cleaner accidentally left it there when he dropped clothes off to Joan earlier that day, coat hangers are a known instrument in botched abortions. Whilst on the side of the freeway, Joan loses more blood, becomes increasingly disorientated and ends up in the construction site. She passes out and dies of complications of the abortion or is killed accidentally in the construction site and is buried as the construction continues without ever being found. As I've stated previously, this is all pure speculation and while it is easy for us to theorise about what may or may not have happened to her, all we really know for sure is that Joan left behind two children and a husband who loved her desperately and have spent the last few 
59 years without her. Martin Reish continued to live in the house he and Joan shared on Old Bedford Road, convinced that she was suffering from amnesia and hoped that one day she would remember her name and return home. He refused to talk to the media about the case and put all of his energy into raising their two children, who have also chosen not to give interviews on their mother's disappearance. Joan was never declared legally deceased, meaning that she and Martin remained married until he died on the 22nd of June 2009. I'm now going to give a brief rundown of Joan's case. Joan Carolyn Reish disappeared on the 24th of October 1961 when she was 31 years old. She was around 5 foot 6 inches tall and weighed approximately 115 pounds. She had brown hair and blue eyes. She was last seen wearing a grey cloth coat, skirt, flat shoes with piping on the side, and her wedding ring which was platinum with diamonds in it. Her fingerprints are available for comparison and she had blood type O. If alive today, she would be 89 years old. If you have any information related to Joan's case, please call the Massachusetts State Police on 781-897-6600 and then quote the case number 6126. All photos and sources on this case can be found on our website, uncovertruecrimepodcast.co.uk. That's everything I have for you today. Thank you for listening till the very end. Please stay safe and have a good night.